um, method. Okay. okay. Try to troubleshoot with her. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Ben Rue, Program Coordinator for the Full Home on Workplace Inclusion. I'm pleased to have you all here for today's webinar, The Boss is Dead, Leveraging Inclusion to Move Beyond Limits of Hierarchy. This presenter, Judith H. Katz of the Colonel Jameson Consulting Group, Inc. Um, <clears throat> this is the fourth webinar in our 10-part 2017 series sponsored by Aon. We hope you enjoy this experience, find the information helpful in your work, and that you will consider joining us for future webinars, one each month all year long. Today, Judith will present for 45 to 50 minutes with um, time reserved at the end for Q&A. There will also be opportunities for questions periodically throughout the webinar. Today's presentation is um, Shiram CEO eligible. Also note that it is being recorded and will be posted to our website next week. For those who are on Twitter, use the uh, use hashtag forum webinar to share your thoughts and follow along. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Judith to get us started. Okay, great. Thanks, Ben. Um, welcome, everybody. I hope there's, we've had a little technical difficulty, so I'm hoping everybody's going to be on the screen with us um, today. And um, I'm really excited about talking about The Boss is Dead. This is uh, one of the things that I've, as I've been working in clients, um, really seeing a shift, a major shift in our organization and organizations based on diversity and inclusion and how that's really uh, changing. Um, organizations. And um, so I'm just going to say a little bit about me and the firm, and then we're going to just dive right in. So um, I'm, as Ben said, I'm with the Khalil Jameson Consulting Group. Um, our firm has been around since 1970, and our work is really focused on uh, aligning cultures of inclusion and business ex execution to achieve um, and accelerate performance. And um, then I'm, I'm getting a lot of feedback, just, just so you know, I'm getting typing and stuff. I don't know if that needs to meet yourself. So, um, just so you know. All right. Uh, kind of let's. So now. Okay. One moment here. All right. So today, here's what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to talk about the concepts of leadership that are changing or dying in organizations. We're going to be looking at some understanding of the mindsets and behaviors, particularly the choice about judging and joining that are supporting everyday leadership in a changing workplace. And we're going to talk about some strategies that we think can really make a difference in terms of um, successful, inclusive interactions. And the thing that I am um, really uh, struck by in organizations today in terms of so many of our organizations are built on the military model. And, you know, if you think about it, why is the boss is dead so critical? Um, the one thing that we know is many of the models of our organizations are really outdated models. And so we're going to kind of play around with this notion about what does it mean to be a boss? What does it mean to be working in organizations today? How has diversity and inclusion really changed the nature of what's needed from leaders um, so that we can really talk about the ways in which we all need to be different? Um, I think the irony, I was just going to say one thing about the military model that's interesting. We worked for um, uh, Allstate many years ago, and they were talking about being founded by a general. And so they had very much a very strong hierarchy. And what was interesting about that is that even as they talked about the military model, what was so striking was even the military model has changed. You know, it's no longer some general sitting in some place deciding everything. It's really the people on the ground who are making the decisions because they have the data right in front of them. So we're going to be talking about that. Um, one of the things that uh, um, I wanted to just ask people, and so you might be thinking about this, is kind of how much has the idea, sorry, how much is the idea about the boss um, really changed to reflect this inclusive, diverse workplace? And I think one of the things that we know um, is that in many ways it hasn't changed if we think about it. So uh, one of my colleagues and I went and did a, um, a little uh, um, uh, search in terms of uh, what does it mean to be a boss? And if you look at these pictures, right, it says a lot. Um, we still hold the image of a white man 
who's the boss uh, for the most part. Um, and although there's been some shifts in terms of thinking about a boss, a boss being cool, right? We try to kind of expropriate the word. Um, in many ways, we still have this image of a male who, who may be angry, who may be yelling, who may be demanding, who may be in many ways um, uh, telling us what to do. Um, the interesting thing about the word boss, I did a little bit of research on this, and the interesting thing about the boss, it was actually the, the first time the word showed up was in the 1700s. And it showed up um, as a alternative to the word master. Think about this, 1700s, the word master, because that was too closely associated with slavery. So even the derivative of what it means to be the boss, which depends on authority, being controlling, being all-knowing, um, being the person who has to have all the information, telling others what to do, um, demanding blind obedience in many ways, um, you know, placing the blame for breakdowns on others. These are the images we all have internalized and carry about what it means to be a boss. And as I've worked in many organizations, you know, there's still a huge shift from many leaders to not think that that's their job or that's their role in terms of bossing, being the boss, or even us thinking about, it. we've all internalized, you think about unconscious bias, we've also internalized our own notions about the boss, right? And how do we think about other people and what they should be doing or how they should be. Um, so if you think about these images, and I'll be curious to hear as uh, we kind of do some of the chat and conversations, um, you know, how vibrant or how alive is this notion of boss in your organization that you serve or that you consult to. Um, so we're gonna talk, talk a little bit about the boss is dead and what that really means and looks like. Um, you know, the thing that I think is so critical with four generations in the workplace, with greater diversity and being in many of the global organizations that we work with, is that um, social media, a hyper-connected workforce, um, particularly uh, millennials and younger people are really hyper-connected, um, are really shifting this notion. And if you think about how young people grew up, you know, this notion that I'm the boss because I said so, or the boss needs to have all the answers, really is no longer a vibrant structure. And I know in many organizations, just because the boss says so, it's like, okay, that was an idea, but it doesn't mean that people necessarily follow. Um, I think the notion about power and what power is and how people use power and how much power we give to our bosses or those people who define as our bosses is also shifting. You know, I can remember when my dad, um, uh, who is kind of think about the World War II generation, um, he would say, when my father told me something, I would listen to him and I would follow what he said. And I'd say, that's good for you, but it wasn't for me. So, you know, generations have shifted in terms of even what we expect from our parents, right? And then we bring that into the workplace. You know, I, I think about when my granddaughter is growing up, you know, her parents aren't teaching her because I said so. What they're saying is, here are your choices. How do you think about this? What do you think? That same expectation of behavior is what I think people are expecting in the workplace too. So they don't want a boss who's gonna to say to them, go do. They want a boss to say, how are you thinking about this? What are your thoughts? You know, um, here are some suggestions. They want a boss who's more a, a leader, who's more coaching, um, as opposed to more telling. And so this notion about yes, boss, and you know, whatever you say goes, you know, unless you're really in deference, and unless you're really kind of given up and no longer engaged, most people are not just going to go and be rolled over. Um, so I think we've seen a major shift. You know, I, I think about, you know, years ago I worked in DuPont and um, there it was a whole issue about, you know, people would stay for a long, long time into the organization. And so this blind trust in leaders was like, well, you know, we've all grown up together and I trust this leader. And, you know, hierarchy and tenure was the currency. But now, you know, people are not sitting in their seat to progress to a higher level in the organization. And you know, most I was working with some millennials recently and they were saying, I love this organization, I really am committed here. And so they said, I think I'm gonna stay two years. 
So their notion was, I'm not sitting in a seat to wait to move up to maybe some job that may or may not happen. So this notion about hierarchy, tenure, um, the DuPont example would be somebody saying, I'm still new here. I've only been here 15 years. How many people now feel like 15 years is new? It's a lifetime. So I think the notion about this, this kind of hierarchy, boss is dead, um, this, this way of thinking about leadership and how much people think, well, I'm the boss, I said it, therefore people should follow me. This doesn't make a lot of sense anymore. And I think the more diverse a workforce is and the more um, it really strives to be inclusive, then I think the challenge becomes even more so that these frameworks don't work um, any longer. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how and why um, and what other things we're seeing dying at the same time. So um, we know, for example, that with four generations in the workplace, that um, the notion of one generation being the leaders is gone. Um, there's no longer a case about you have to be, you know, the baby boomers will hopefully move out one of these days. <laughs> but um, what we're finding is, you know, younger people are now in leadership roles and yet older people may be reporting to them. So we have all of those notions about what takes to sit in those seats and move up the organization, et cetera, really don't work. Um, the notion about one size fits all, you know, the, how leaders used to treat or our bosses used to treat everybody the same because that's what, what fairness is. You know, that model we know, particularly I think that's one of the things diversity has brought into the workplace is fairness is not treating everyone the same. And, you know, we're seeing it in products, you know, in the old days, a hundred years ago, uh, you could have a, a, a Ford and you could have any color you want as long as it was black, right? Now you can design your own cars and you can design your own, um, uh, go online and just design your own uh, products and services and customize it. Customization is the way of working. And the same is true in terms of what's happening around leadership and what's happening in the organization. So this notion about differentiation and being able to differentiate is really, really a critical element. Um, and I think the big thing that we're seeing is, you know, this notion about people working alone. Um, I'm not seeing any longer being the currency of an organization. So in, in the old days, you know, when this notion about a boss and people did their own work, um, you I'd identified the stars and then there were other people in the organization. You know, I don't know any organization today where people can work alone to accomplish the organization's objectives, truly work alone. Um, I was just on a call this morning with a global leadership team. And one of the things that they keep talking about is the, all the ways in which they need to work together across the organization, across functions, across silos, across departments to solve customer needs and to solve complex problems. And so, you know, even as we think about how organizations are structured, which we'll talk about in a moment, you know, we can deal with the complexity of the world, the marketplace, um, the missions that organizations are addressing, whether they're profit or nonprofit, um, by working alone. And I think that, again, that's one of the other things that are dying along with this notion about the boss. Um, so what are some of the other deaths? You know, so just in terms of, of following on around the notion of working alone, therefore, even the idea of an individual contributor doesn't make sense because nobody is an individual contributor. We've kind of have these old frameworks of there's an individual contributor and a manager, and that somehow that those titles actually work. Um, you know, one of the things many organizations are changing is performance reviews. So there used to be a time, right? Twice a year, once a year, you get this performance review, the worst day of your life, where um, everybody sits down and tells you what you did last year and the things you did well or didn't do well, that kind of like, okay, that focused on the past. Um, interestingly, about 70% of multinationals are moving away from performance reviews in terms of the traditional way of doing it. And Deloitte recently uh, did a survey and said that they were investing 1.8 million hours across the firm to do performance reviews. 1.8 million hours of people's time across the organization to do performance reviews. So organizations are finding that this is just not viable. It's a waste of time. It's not a good use of engaging people. It's not actually helpful to people's development. 
And so what are they finding instead? So instead of focusing on the past behavior, they're really looking at how do we groom talent? How do I give you feedback um, uh, in a fast way? Uh, a couple of organizations that I'm working with now have an app where people can give you, come out of a meeting and I can give you some feedback right away about how that meeting went. So that hyper-connectivity is also impacting the ways in which we're engaging each other and also what's useful data. Um, there's a great article from the Harvard Business Review in 2016, which just talks about how this, these performance reviews are gone and going. Um, so if you're interested in that, that's an important thing to kind of look at. Um, I've said a little bit before about silos. Um, most of our organizations, again, we'll talk a little bit more about the model, are based on a very regimented organizational structure. And people are working within a department, helps to create focus, but that's not how work gets done. So even the ways our organizations are structured doesn't really work for today's workforce or for today's problems that are solving. And then I think, myself included as a baby boomer, um, many, many years ago, you know, we thought about retiring. Um, two things are changing that. One is we're living to a much larger, longer age. And so the notion about, okay, so if I retire at 65, what am I going to do for the next 35 years? Um, my business partner, Fred Miller, his mother's 105. So you think about it. If you were retiring at 60 or 65, what are you going to do for 45 years? You know, it's changed the whole equation where it used to be you retired and then you'd live a nice little life for a little while and then you'd be dead. Um, so this notion of retirement and the financials around it also don't work. Um, so many people aren't thinking about when they start the retirement program or retirement savings, oh my God, I need money for 50 years. Um, so this notion about retirement, um, which also then speaks to how organizations are structured, because many of our organizations, HR systems, management policies, are all about hire to retire. So keeping top talent for years, this notion about, again, moving into our seats, many of the organizations that, that I'm in, if you ask people how long are you going to stay, really three to five years may be how long they're going to be there. Um, it's unusual now for people to be in an organization for their whole career. And if you think about how many years we're working, this notion and these structures about hire to retire just actually don't work. So a lot of organizations we're in are really struggling with what does that mean? How do we then have to think about people differently? How do we have to think about talent differently? So all of this says we've got to really think about not tweaking change, but transformational change. So when we talk about the boss is dead, it's not just the boss is dead. It's really many of the things that we once held sacred, um, many of the structures that we created in our organizations. Um, as we think about a global, inclusive, diverse workforce that want to be engaged, that want to be able to, to contribute, that are hyper-connected, um, where Glassdoor can tell you more about an organization than you might find out inside the organization. Um, all of those things are dramatically changing the ways in which people need to lead, people need to engage, people need to work together, um, that the organization needs to, to really function. So I'm going to um, just breathe here for a minute. And I have a question for us, or there may be some questions that people are posing or putting on the chat that we could like spend a few minutes on. And then we're gonna kind of move into some of the other challenges. So Steve or Ben, um, if there's anything on the chat or do people wanna to respond to this? Hi, Jim, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat yet. Do encourage anyone who has any questions to post their questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Like right now we have you muted, so you can unmute yourself to ask the question um, uh, and, then so, re yeah. and then mute yourself once it's done. Right. And I'd love to just hear from people, you know, uh, uh, what are you seeing in your organization? How much of these trends or uh, things that we're seeing dying or needing to die um, going on in the organizations that you're a part of? Not um, less hierarchy, more collaboration. Right. Great. Anybody else? Otherwise, I'll keep moving.
Okay. All right. So I anything else? I'm a big picture of vision for the entire organization instead of just my business. Mm, nice. And I, I think that really speaks to, you know, um, I can I, I see the chat here too. Um, Anne-Marie um, Johnson's uh, point. You know, I think that really speaks to the fact that that people may be talking about that and may we hold that. The question is how are we functioning? So, you know, in many organizations, I think I'm hearing the words. I'm, I'm, I think about a client I'm working with next week where everybody agrees inclusion is important, but they're not necessarily operationalizing that in terms of their business or in terms of the ways they function or in terms of sharing information. So I think in many ways we are seeing organizations understand the boss is dead, understand this hierarchy is work, understanding we need more collaboration. I think the vestiges of the behaviors that we are experiencing very much um, kind of stay into that, how do we really make that shift uh, into the organization that we need to be? So I think that's one of our huge challenges that we're seeing uh, for sure. So, and you know, and that's a continuum. So I think organizations have moved, some still industrial revolutionary model. And even those organizations that say they want to be different, I think about some of the tech firms, you know, big challenge about some of those organizations is they haven't done the diversity and inclusion work that they need to do. So, you know, they may be lagging in terms of really being able to have the culture that they need to really engage people and to really have people feel welcomed and valued. So, you know, I think there's lots of different elements of those vestiges of the industrial revolution, the club, all of that that we're seeing that need to change. Okay, so I will continue. Um, and again, just I'd love to hear, you know, as people agree, agreement is good um, as well in terms of what you're seeing and experiencing. All right. So. Okay, so my PowerPoint does not want to move. Okay, so um, one of the things that I would say is there's some from two challenges that I think some of you already will well, kind of identify and acknowledge. And I think there's a couple of things that I think one of the things I'm excited about around diversity and inclusion that's really kind of helped make this shift. So I think as we think about different populations coming into the organization, shifts in mindset. You know, here's just some of them. There's actually, um, um, we'll talk some more about them. But, you know, when we've really moved, I think, in some organizations from seeing differences as a deficit, to now really embracing differences as an asset. So as organizations are thinking about this notion about the boss and the boss being dead, and, and what does this mean? How do you really begin to get organizations to see, oh, differences really are an asset, and in the ways in which they actually ask the right set of questions? So, you know, um, one of the leaders I worked with said, I know we'll really be inclusive when we don't have the same group of people always going into the room to solve every problem. And I know we'll really be inclusive when we really do ask the question, who are the right people to be involved in this conversation? And really bring those different voices in from backgrounds, experiences to solve a complex problem instead of just going on automatic. Um, so this challenge about, you know, do we really leverage the differences that we need? Um, assimilating and fitting, to, fitting in to succeed, to really enabling people to bring their whole range of differences. And I still think in many organizations, you know, the only place we allow people to really bring their differences in is often in, in the ERG, as opposed to really bringing them into the work part of the business. And so making that legitimate to say, how do we really enable people to bring their differences into that conversation when we're um, problem solving about a business issue, um, as, as opposed to a one-off in the ERG and, and being in that kind of context. We've talked about honoring and rewarding tenure to honoring and rewarding contribution. Um, one of my, my clients now, when they have a business problem that they've solved, they talk about not only it's first of all looking at contribution so we're saying okay what have you achieved not, not how long have you been here um, 
and really being able to look at the accomplishments um, from a what and a how. Um, I think the person who spoke about collaboration uh, before is really spoke to this issue, which is how do we see colleagues as competitors versus see colleagues as partners rather than competitors? And you know, I think in many organizations, although people say we need to collaborate, there's still a undercurrent about somebody's going to get the promotion, who's it going to be? And I think this notion about um, uh, uh, limited resources or limited roles, as opposed to how do we really think about everyone, I think is one of the challenges we're going to be facing more and more in organizations. Um, the thing that we've been really working on in many of our contexts is this notion about, is the culture a judging culture? Or is this culture one in which is really joining and inclusive? And let me just say a little bit about the difference. Um, many of the organizations that we're in, the first response that people have is not giving the benefit of the doubt, um, holding on to past data, looking at who to blame, um, trying to find fault. And that's often the judging culture. So we're kind of looking at the ways in which um, we have to earn trust instead of give trust. Uh, in a joining culture, we start with the assumption that we're going to partner. We start with the assumption that we're going to give each other the benefit of the doubt. And we start with the assumption that you and I together will have more than we have separately. So in a judging culture, I often see the people kind of being, I'm the smartest person in the room, or assessing everybody else's behaviors and what they're not doing. In a joining culture, this is a, there was a, uh, an example of this yesterday when I was in a client, and one of the things somebody said was, we had a problem. Instead of telling, identifying why these people were wrong, I tried to find out what was going on for them so we could figure out how to solve it. And it was somebody in a technology organization. So instead of telling people how they weren't using the, the technology right, they actually listened as allies and found out how to really solve the problem that was underneath it. And I think that the joining culture really spends, needs to spend the time for people to develop the partnerships that they need to really understand one another. So this notion about judging and joining has become a fundamental shift um, that's critical for the organization to be successful. And I would just say that for many of us, um, we're really seeing that, do I start from judging you or do I start from joining? And this is where our biases come in and where a lot of the notions about that is part of the challenge. So for us, fundamental is the shift from judging to joining. And then the other things we'd see um, in terms of really uh, the shift is people keeping problems hidden to really making them visible and solving them at their root cause. Um, one of our clients this is part of the judging culture as well. Um, instead of asking the five whys, which is kind of critical to root cause problem solving, they would ask the five who's. Who did it? Who did it? Who did it? Who did it? And instead, what they're really trying to do is kind of get underneath that and really ask the five whys and really get to solving that root cause. Um, the other thing is we're finding that people often send emails, not because they just want to have communication, but it's really to keep problems hidden or to feel, to create that blame. And so um, one of the challenges around, um, uh, around emails is that often we're trying to keep our problems hidden or, or blame someone else. Um, we've already talked about leaders having all the answers. So I think we're seeing a shift from, you know, the leader being having to know everything, have all the data, to really being able to engage the right people to find the right solutions. And, in many, many of the organizations with the need for speed, um, so many people feel like, I don't have time to slow down, I don't have time to engage, I don't have time to interact. Where, and so the, the challenge is trying to go faster, go faster, whereas really the key is, how do we slow down to go faster? Um, we were in one organization where we were talking about this idea and somebody said, we don't have time to really slow down. And then we asked them, do you do a lot of rework? And they said, yeah, we have rework all the time. So the issue was, they, it was almost normative to make mistakes. 
and um, and they weren't learning anything. So they kept on making the same mistakes. And so the challenge for many organizations is how do we slow down so we can actually go faster, getting the right people involved, having the right conversations, making sure we're doing the right work. Um, and then I think the big shift around also, again, the boss is dead, is this notion about following leaders or following peers. I think one of the things that social media has changed dramatically is people in organizations are more likely to listen to their peers than they are likely to listen to their boss. So if my colleague says this is a great idea, I'm able to follow that. I'm probably more willing to listen. Um, when my boss says, go do it, I may be less willing to do that. And so this notion about following peers, I think is really where we see the possibility also of change. And a lot of the change strategies that we've been employing in organizations really is about engaging peer-to-peer -peer leadership and peer-to-peer -peer change, because that's where we see having the most possibilities. So let me just um, take a moment here. Um, ben, I'm getting a bunch of feedback. I don't know if other people are too. Um, so I just want to check in with you and also see if there's any comments that people have at this moment. I, I'm not. I'm not sure why you're getting the feedback. I have everybody muted. Um, okay. But right. I'm kind of hearing a little bit, a little bit too. Um, yeah, I, I don't get. If, yeah, if everybody could. I, again, I don't understand why, but because everybody yep. is muted. Um, I know. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe let's hear a couple of comments and see if there's any. Um, in particular, anything in the chat around some of the challenges from two is what people are seeing. I don't see anything. Okay. I heard a comment about the muted noise, but um, all right. So this is our technology. How about <laughs> how about anything? Um, how do we create? I don't know what the rest of that is, Tara. <laughs> All right. So again, um, there's so many messages. But people can go fast with that if you're American history. So there's at least talk about all this, but how are people implementing? Great. Thanks, Christy. Um, so well, we'll talk a little bit about some things we're seeing um, in terms of that change in a moment. Um, and obviously other people, if you have um, um, some ideas about this is really critical. I would say one of the things that we're seeing in an organization um, in terms of the, the issue about going fast without fear of making mistakes. You know, one of the things that, that I think we make mistakes, particularly when, and we're always gonna make mistakes. So I think the question is, can we learn about those? But I think the other challenge about that is, how do I really make sure that, um, that we have the right people involved front end so we make fewer mistakes. And one of our clients who is great at execution, I mean, they are like, they could execute on a dime, um, but the problem is, you know, they don't do the after uh, execution conversation to really think about what do we learn, what could we have done differently? And now they're beginning to actually slow down to do that, at least to do an after action. And what that's enabled them to do is to really think about, um, this notion about, you know, we're gonna make mistakes, we, we're gonna have do-overs, here's some process improvements, here's some ways we could have done that differently. But before they were going from thing to thing to thing, and they weren't really taking the time to really think about um, what we could have done, or what, you know, what bodies did we leave along the way because of the way we implemented this. So I think there's something about, you know, I, I keep on thinking about, I think inclusion, and really leveraging differences means the organization has to actually have more rigor instead of less rigor. And I think it means we have to spend more um, focus on making sure that we're doing the right work with the right people and being able to really implement that kind of culture change. Um, so I think there's one of the places where I would say it's um, really critical that, you know, obviously one of you know, mistakes are gonna happen Obviously, nobody should be shot for them unless they're really a really huge mistake, and we have to have a different kind of conversation. But I think to expect that we're going to be able to move fast um, 
um, and not make mistakes is just not doable. I don't think it's reasonable. Um, even when we go slow, sometimes we're going to make mistakes. So I think those are all some of the challenges that we see. And others may have something else to add about this um, as well. OK. Um, Right, absolutely. Uh, so the, the lead, having leaders in the organization support those who do, listening, sharing perspective, and leaving time to reflect is absolutely critical, which is, I think, why the boss is dead is so powerful, because it really does mean leaders have to have a different kind of role. And you know, when they're so used to being in charge, when they're so used to being the way the answer people, when that's um, a, you know, really moving to a leadership, a coaching role, a support role, which I think is what um, uh, your, this last chat person speaks to, I think is really getting leaders comfortable. One of the big things that I'm working with a lot of leaders about is being vulnerable. You know, being able to say, I don't know, being able to ask questions of others. So one of the big things that um, we talk a lot about in uh, some of the behaviors that we do around conscious actions for inclusion is to really listen as allies, to really lean into the discomfort of being vulnerable, of not knowing. And I think that's some of the work for working with leaders at all levels, um, to move from this notion of boss, being in control, having all the answers, um, um, commanding, um, telling people to go do's, to really, I love this thing about listening, sharing, leaving time to reflect, learning, and learning with people. Um, in many clients I'm in, somebody says, nobody ever asked me my opinion. And this is senior leaders who are reporting to other senior leaders. So, you know, you can just watch people blossom when they move out of that command role into more of a coaching, support, engaging role. Um, and, you know, we all know engagement, right, is such a kind of buzzword these days. Um, and everybody's talking about the need for engagement. But many of our leaders don't know how to engage. Um, so it's not about, you know, uh, I think about meetings. You know, so many people are doing meetings as, as a PowerPoint. I even hate these, you know, this format because we're not engaging with each other. Um, so, you know, meetings by PowerPoint is not a meeting. That's just sharing information. And, you know, in many ways, I think we still have those old one way, one style, one approach to really engaging people and not really getting their best thinking and wisdom. Um, so for us, I think this, this notion about really moving from a boss to a leader to really understanding that we need everyone's thinking um, and creating that environment where people speak up, where people feel safe, where people really feel like they can engage in a productive way is, is absolutely critical. Um, so I appreciate the comments there. They're helpful to me because um, I'm an extrovert and I find that useful. So um, if there's other comments, love to hear them. Okay. So let's see, I'm gonna move to um, next slide here, I hope. All right, all right. So the, I love this slide because I think in many ways it speaks to the reality of the shift. And if we think about the organizations um, on the left-hand side, what was the traditional organization, most of our organizations still have an org chart and still look like those, the, uh, the diagram on the left. And yet, most organizations are operating on the right. And yet, what we haven't done, and I think what we will be seeing, I think there's holacracy and some other new models of organizations, is we've got to really think about how do we describe and how do we create systems and structures and processes <coughs> for the organization that's really networked. Because in many ways, that's the future, and that's actually the reality of many of the ways systems are operating today. And so as we think about flatter organizations, as we think about getting the right people to work together, um, as we think about you know, how do we need to engage with each other to solve the problems that we need to, how do we know who's in those networks so that we can actually find the right people to work with? And if you're a global organization, that becomes an even bigger challenge, right? Um, and how many people are working with teams across the globe to be able to solve those problems? One of the things that I love about the networked organization, uh, one of my clients, um, a women's clothing company, the leader of the organization, she talks about how she 
her notion about leadership is cracking open the center. And so instead of thinking about leaders in terms of the boxes, she thinks about them as the circles and who's in concentric circles and how those circles engage and are fluid with one another. And so she's experimenting with title, getting rid of some of the titles and getting rid of some of those vestiges that kind of defined who sat in a box and really thinking about a much more fluid way of engaging and a fluid way of structuring the organization. Um, still with differentiated roles, but that again means a higher level of skill for people to know how to engage. And I know Gore, um, W.L. Gore company, who has done a lot of work with um, a very different kind of a model as well, has really moved into uh, less of the traditional hierarchy and more in terms of how teams like formed and associates have a much bigger voice um, in their decision making and in their performance evaluations and processes. So I think organizations were in this middle of this huge transformation. Um, and I think that in many ways, we talked about, you know, what's dying. Um, I think over the next, hopefully 10, 20 years, we're going to see huge shifts in terms of what an organizational structure looks like. Um, you know, if we think about an organization like Slack, which is saying, you know, we're a technology company, we're going to build diversity in from the beginning. They're really changing some of the rules of their game. And I think this is part of what gets exciting when we start thinking about this moment of transition and transformation that we're in, because in many ways, this old model, this traditional model is still based on the boss, the hierarchy, and all of that. So even though we say we're moving to collaboration, even though we say, you know, how many organizations are um, uh, evaluating or, or supporting or recognizing people based on the teamwork. Some are, not all. Um, so we still have those systems and structures that are still based in that left-hand model and not enough that are actually moving yet to the right-hand model. Um, so we're seeing again, you know, I mean, I'll be curious as we looked at organizations in the next five or 10 years to see what are those new forms of how we think about uh, structure because I think structure defines much in terms of interactions as well. So um, this is just a quick model I just wanted to kind of put up here, but I think, you know, to me, just as we saw the networks organization, I think we really need to think about as organizations move from slow and steady state to this world of change, what does that mean in terms of how we have to operate? And the X in the middle of this, um, if you think about these two uh, uh, um, um, crossroads, um, it, the X in the middle is almost like a, uh, the unknown and the unknowables. Um, or you could think about it as an accident that happens. And in many ways, in our organizations, for the most part, in the old days, what we would do, if you look at the upper right-hand corner, you see valuing sameness. We used to say to people, okay, you all come together, tell us about the problem, and you solve it. And you get people from what I would say one street corner. Um, the problem is that was one style, one way, one view, one group. And what we're really seeing, if we really want to solve this X in the middle, we actually need people on all these different corners and all these different positions with all their differences, being able to bring their knowledge, their skills, and their abilities to bear. Um, and the challenge is often when people do bring a different point of view in, what they often do is they get told about how their perspective is wrong. And what I think our options and our challenges are is, how do we co-create that collaboration and connection to be able to feel safe enough to engage around that? And to really recognize we really don't, one group does not have the answer to that X. Um, that one group does not really have the solution to that X. And so we really need to be able to pull people in, to really get people leaning in, um, to really get people joining, not judging, and to really enable them to show up in a way that's gonna bring their voice. Um, and so for us, as I think, think about this model, I think to, to me, this is kind of the challenge in front of us today. So, you know, we've gone from those boxes being very neat and clean and everything's kind of in its place to a world of complexity that um, all of us need to solve together. So I'm going to stop for a moment and we're going to talk a little bit about some actions. But um, before I do, uh, anything people want to say about complexity, organizations, we're just and I'll move back for a moment. Any comments, any thoughts? Ben, anything on the chat? 
Um, no, other than um, from Sarah, who says it's so good to, it's so hard for organizations to let go of organizational charts. And um, we, uh, one that says, what are nibbles? Uh, <laughs> oh, good. Thanks. Oh, thank you for that. So Nibbles is one of the things Khalil Jameson wrote was a book called The Nibble Theory. And Nibbles is kind of how people, um, you know, you think about the, in the, oh, I'm dating myself here, the Pac-Man, when people take a bite out of you. And so it's, you know, I see a lot of times in organizations how um, people will be bad-mouthing other people, gossiping about other people, um, nibbling, you know, if you think about nibbling and making people small. Um, and the ways in which in organizations um, there's not that support of each other, but it's really looking at ways to tear people down. And, you know, I think, I'm, just as a little aside, I mean, I think we're in such a moment right now because of the social political context that we're in that this becomes even harder. Um, you know, I see on a daily basis the walls that are being put up between people because of political affiliation, because of what's happening in our larger society. And, you know, in organizations today, it's the one place we come together. It's the one place we come together to achieve something together. And I think the, way, the real challenge we're faced with as well, the nibbles are part of that, is how do we really work together with those differences and in a way that creates a safe place. And I just wrote a blog um, last week about how do we create an environment was we know our colleagues may be experiencing harassment of a, a, a recent uh, situation that I'm sure many of you on this phone have experienced or know of colleagues who are experiencing is um, one of my colleagues who's Muslim, his wife was in the shopping mall and he was on the phone with her for 30 minutes because somebody was following her and she was frightened. And she was, you know, somebody made some comments to her that were um, pretty biased. And um, so he, the only thing he could do was be on the phone with her, but obviously he wasn't able to do his best work when he's worried about his wife and her safety. Um, other colleagues, you know, who are worried about being their, their family members being deported or uh, an African-American colleague of mine whose um, son came home from school and said, mommy and daddy, do we have to move because my parents, uh, because uh, in school today, somebody wrote, this is a school for whites only. So I think there's a lot of ways in which our outside society is coming inside our organizations, and we have to figure out ways to make it safe to feel that people can address and feel like they've got the support of their colleagues in the organization. And I think, you know, there was a time, the other thing I would just add to this PowerPoint that I hadn't thought about was, you know, in the old days, the external world was external, and the internal world was, the internal world of the organization was internal, and the boundary was clear. That boundary is no longer clear anymore. And I think that's the other thing that people and leaders need to know how to deal with effectively. It's like, how do I deal with this world of complexity, depending on no matter what our political affiliations or ideas are? How do I make it safe enough for us to work together here, that we're not seeing each other as adversaries? And creating a safe place where we know that what's happening in the external world may be impacting us even more so in terms of the internal world of the organization. And I think in the old days, there was, you know, this boundary. What's outside of work is outside of work. What's inside of work is inside. When we're working 24-7 and what's not a nine to five and boundaries have been blurred, you know, in many ways, I think we still haven't adopted the ways in which we need to address that fully in our organization. So, you know, there's the level of how society is impinging. It always has impinged in our organizations, but I think even more so today with communications and with media that, you know, it's not uncommon for me to be in an organization where there's a um, TV screen up that people see in the lunchroom. And you know, whatever that TV screen is, maybe influencing the interactions that people are having inside that organization as well. So I think there's the level of communication information that's also impacting us. But thanks for the Nibbles comment, because that's really about how are we really not supporting one another, but really kind of tearing one another down. And I think those behaviors just don't help us if we're really trying to accomplish some goals and objectives in the organization. And really creating a safe, diverse, vibrant, inclusive culture. So um, a major challenge, I think, for us all. Okay. And so we will move to some of the actions. We hopefully will move to some of the actions.
So, um, so I guess there's a couple of things that we would let, we would kind of highlight here. Um, you know, I think overall, I would say we've got to really just rethink um, all of our systems and structures because so many of them are based in an old hierarchy way of thinking, and many of them really are based on kind of uh, an assumption that um, this workforce is stable, it won't change dramatically. And I think the flexibility that we need needs to change dramatically. Um, so rethinking whether hire to retire makes sense in your organization, how much flexibility and how much are you thinking differently um, about moving people into the organization, moving people up, giving them opportunities, um, all of that in terms of what millennials and Gen Xers and each generation need. I mean, one of the things, I mean, one client right now, which is really striking is they are giving job opportunities to people who you would think are ready to retire. So a 30 year person who's been in the organization might get a stretch assignment in, in past organizations that would never have happened. The assumption would have been, oh, they're out the door. Well, they're talent, they bring things, why should I stop their expectations? And similarly, excuse me, I was in an organization recently where there was a young woman, 22 years old. She had been an entrepreneur since she was like 13. And um, she was doing the job of what had been traditionally a vice president. And so the organization gave her the title, rightly so, because why should she wait for another 10 years to get that title? So I think that flexibility and thinking differently and really looking at that person and what skills they're bringing and not being stuck in our biases about how, what age they could be and when they could move and what that looks like um, is really something that's got to change. In fact, I think there's a different model of thinking about people as free agents and that really needing to think about the fact that, you know, people might come and come into the organization. You know, I think one of Ernest and Young, I think is doing is a whole alumni organization where the assumption is you might leave, you might come back. And so we want to keep you connected into the organization because just because you've left doesn't mean you're going to be gone forever. And so it's really a very different model of thinking about people and thinking about their connection to the organization and thinking about how long they might be there. Um, transforming performance reviews, I said a little bit about that already, to focus on the development and future and really more real time feedback which means that leaders, partners, peers, everybody needs to really be seeing and developing that muscle of that feedback in a way that's kind of ongoing. You know, we do it all the time online, right? How many of us are doing surveys or responding to things? I just got a call uh, with a healthcare provider who said, would you be willing to give feedback at the end of this call? I mean, we're doing it so much in our life outside of work. Can we do that with each other inside of work? And leaders recognizing the real need to build trust. It can't be assumed. And it can't be assumed just because I'm the leader that I'm gonna have that. So that means that a leader needs to have courage, be vulnerable, be flexible, be competent in interacting across differences. Um, the leaders, I think, in the, in the past would assume I'm competent. Now I think what we're seeing, leaders need to be very self-reflective about the areas where they don't have competence, particularly when it comes to people, particularly when it comes to differences. And so for us, those actions are, means that, you know, leadership and learning is lifelong. It doesn't stop. And I think for many leaders, they're not getting the feedback that they need to really understand how they're showing up in the organization. Some people are doing reverse mentoring. That's great. Um, one of the practices that we've instituted is leaders identifying a small group of five to six people who meet with them monthly to give them feedback. And this group of people, um, the leader identifies the behaviors that they're working on. And this is a group of people who are not their direct reports. There may be a direct report among them, but it's diverse. And they're getting face-to-face -face feedback on the ways in which they're showing up so that they're able to grow and develop. But they're also getting that honest um, inf information about are they being the leaders that they need to be for the organization. So instead of I know everything, it's really that recognition that I need to grow, I need to learn. Um, and uh, we've written an article about that if anybody's interested in learning more, but we call it leadership feedback pods. Um, and it's been a really incredible practice. And most leaders talk about the fact that they may get a 360, but even that is still anonymous. So they wouldn't get the feedback that I might give you saying, you know, in that meeting, that town hall yesterday, here are some things you could have done differently, or here's what you did well, here's some things that you could have improved your performance. 
And so it's, a, it's risky, but it's also really setting a new tone, that vulnerability in the organization. And so it really says to the organization, I'm willing to learn. I'm not the boss. I don't know everything. Um, I mean, I'm the, I may be your leader, but I don't know everything. And I'm willing to grow and learn. Um, so that's a huge shift for leaders in terms of moving from that boss to really leader and building that trust and knowing can't be assumed. The other thing we would say, particularly knowing how much peer-to-peer -peer is critical in organizations, is really engaging peers to support one another, coach one another, mentor one another, in addition to roles whatever traditional leaders might play. Um, really enabling and supporting people to come together, which is where we see um, acceleration um, in terms of change as well. Because peers, if they are kind of see that as their role, how much more powerful is that when they get it from a colleague to know, how am I showing up? How am I impacting you? <coughs> how are we doing in terms of working together? Um, so peer-to-peer -peer and recognizing the role that peer-to-peer plays not only in social media, but the, the role and the potential role that it can play within the organization is really a powerful um, instrument. Moving from hierarchy and tenure for promotions and successions, developing ways to identify talents and leaders at all levels. Um, Many organizations, you know, moving to lattice as opposed to moving up as the only way for success. And I would say that even this notion about, you know, years ago, there used to be in organizations like people would always talk about the tenure. One client I had had a pin that people wore with a different colored diamond or stone in it um, based on their tenure in the organization. And now they're doing away with all of that. Because in many ways, I, there was a leader I worked with who said, you know, I appreciate those of you who've been here a long time and what you've done for the organization, but my question is, what are you going to do tomorrow? And um, I may be sounding harsher than it was meant, but I think the point is, you know, what we've done in the past is great, but I think we have to be focused on the future. And so that tenure and hierarchy is not always the answer for promotions. It's really on succession. It's really contribution. And how do we really define contribution, not based on who looks like me, acts like me, and is most like me, but who can really add the most value. And then lastly, I would say that um, to really develop aggressive ways to challenge 20-somethings and offer opportunities for growth, development, and visibility, and learning how we're learning from the gaming culture. Um, one of the things that, as I've worked a lot with millennials and understand um, the whole gaming culture, is that that's such an important part in terms of how people are feeling valued, respected, um, challenged. And so, you know, I have a leader that one of the CEOs we work with who said, I'm really structuring the ways in which I'm creating projects out of the gaming culture. And I'm having them meet with those young people meet with me and tell me what they're learning. And I'm, asking, I'm challenging them with new challenges and I'm engaged with them to learn about how they're growing and learning. And so he sees his job as CEO um, to really develop that group of 20 somethings and give them that that uh, opportunity to hear his thinking, but more for him to hear their thinking. And he's really creating bite-sized work that can really challenge them and enable them. So he's really structuring, rethinking about how he structures work, how he structures projects, how he engages people on that, and, and really um, uh, shifting um, the ways in which uh, the organization has been working. And the other thing that I'm aware of is uh, millennials want more interaction, whether it's texting or engaging, so that hyperconnectivity. So as leaders and as uh, people in an organization, how do we make sure that we're really engaging in a whole different way? Um, and I think that's another skill. You know, it's, it's not up to leaders. You know, I always say leaders don't have the, um, the, the luxury of their preferences. They have to engage with the organization the way the organization needs them to, not in the ways that they feel most comfortable. And I think that's the shift of boss to leader to really moving into this new kind of workplace is we've got to change to what people need, not to the ways in which we feel comfortable. And I think that's where we have to all lean into some discomfort. So I think those were, you know, one of the things you might think about is to what degree does the leadership in your organization need to get different in order to lead the organization that's evolving? Um, and, you know, where are you on that, those continuums and which are the most important ones your organization in terms of change. Um, but I hope today that uh, part of this talk was about, you know, stimulating um, our thinking and, you know, together to think about how do we really move in those directions of moving from the boss is dead to what our organizations need today um, and what they'll even need tomorrow, which will be still quite different. So 
I will stop there. Um, you all know the proverb, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, we got to go together. And my hope is today that um, we'll go together. So Ben, um, I will turn this back to you. All right, wonderful, thank you. So actually before we go, um, Christy said, I totally see Nibble breaking down trust. I've experienced that. Any suggestions for one-liners to stop or discourage Nibbles when we hear it? One-liners I don't have. I think the issue is really about engaging with the person honestly about the impact. And you know, I think that in many ways, I, what I don't want to do is just shut somebody down because it's kind of like my assumption is that they don't want to be, I mean, what's the intent behind that nibble? If you, you know, if you want to put me down, then we have to have this conversation. It's a longer conversation and I appreciate that people are experiencing it. Um, and I think it's, it's easy in organizations to be sarcastic or to do that kind of cut you off at the knees. And, you know, I think the issue is how do we treat each other respectfully? And I think that's part of our work is, um, with, you know, and so I have some people who put no nibbles up it is a no nibble zone, but we have to explain to each other what a nibble is and how do we make that different. So, um, uh, and I'd be happy to chat with whomever, you know, offline about that too. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Judith, and thank you everyone for participating. If we could keep our, keep it, our phones muted. Um, so I just want to, again, thank you all for participating and apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, please join us for our next forum webinar, DNI Training Is Your Organization All In, with presenter Linda Stokes of PRISM, PRISM International, on July 20th. The recording from this session will be posted um, shortly uh, to our website and also will be emailed to everyone um, once that is posted. And although it is a long way off, we don't forget to put in, put into your calendar the 2018 conference, April 10th through 12th here in Minneapolis. The theme next year is Power the Future. The call for presentations are currently open uh, and are open until July, uh, June 29th. If you'd like to propose a future-focused, innovative presentation for the conference, please answer the call for presentations. And, and like I said, by June 29th. And if you are interested in this call, we are doing a webinar, uh, webinar Q&A next week on Wednesday, the 21st at 11 o'clock a.m. Thank you so much for your participation in today's webinar. We look forward to you joining us in the future. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Ben.